Hi, um, this talk is going to be about uh, networking protocols, but it is going to be a talk that anybody can understand if um, I'm not going to use jargon. I'm, I'm going to try to avoid uh, technical jargon, which uh, separates the technologists from the layman, uh, even if you're smart. So I'm going to try to avoid that in order to make this that something that everybody can understand and everybody can follow along. Um, so let's start off with who am I? I'm Caleb James Delisle, a programmer since age 10. I, I, I'm giving this part because I don't really have any uh, PhDs or anything really interesting. I didn't start any huge business, so um, li lifelong tinkerer, pro free market, uh, Dow reading, and inactivist with a passion for programming the world that I would want to live in. Making change by making new technologies that make the world better. Scope of this talk. How the internet works, and how it doesn't work, and what are the social consequences of it's not working, and the mesh revolution, basically, because we have this technology and why it's not being used, and then we're going to define the ISP of the future, which is a, a really interesting thing. Um, and it's not going to be like your old phone company, which charges too much and uh, censors your information. And I'm going to talk about my project, which is CJDNS, and how that might fit in. Um, Basically, CJDS defines the question. It, it, it tries to answer it, but its most important thing is that it defines it. So we'll start off with, like, what's the internet? Um, and it's, it's not a big truck. It's, it's an amorphous group of cooperating independent networks. Um, that is a bunch of companies that have decided to freely connect their wires together. Um, all the internet communications that you do when you go to Google or whatever, that's all broken down into these little packets, these little like postcards with little bits of information on them, and each one's addressed and they're sent out through the internet separately. And uh, so you could think of it as like this really large postal service. Um, now, you could think of a packet like a car, it's running down the road and um, it doesn't really have a driver, so at, e at, at each intersection it has to stop and ask directions. And you could imagine like at each intersection there's a sort of traffic cop and he has a book of all uh, addresses in the world and the packet has the address that it's going to, but it doesn't know the way. So it, it has to go through the book and look up the address and then from that address say, ah, you go right or you go left. And so this, a packet in the way that we do things now has to ask directions at each intersection. Um, now, this book of addresses, um, you might think that you could make a, a little mistake here and there, and it's okay, you know, you're going the right direction generally. Um, that's not always the truth, because if one router, these traffic cops at the intersections, we call them routers, or you call them routers in Europe. Um, uh, um, if the... Uh, if one router sends the packet east and the next router sends the packet west, then it could end up going around in a loop, and because nobody knows any better, that would go around forever. So these routers have to have relatively complete uh, lists of all the addresses in the world. Um, now, there are about 2.5 billion uh, IP addresses in use right now, um, and scanning over that entire list would take a really long time. Like, you would have to, um, your, your packets wouldn't get there. Uh, at each hop, at each stop. So what they rely on is um, the, the, the nature of the internet being um, uh, that the addresses are aggregated. So if all uh, IP addresses in China start with one, then you know that a, an address that is one, I'm just going to send it to China. I'm not going to worry about all the addresses in China. And that's how it works. That's what, make, that's what keeps it from falling apart. Um, the only problem with this is that you need an, an authority to allocate these addresses, and the authorities I can. It's uh, founded by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, they try; they're, they're they're largely good people, but you still have politics, and because of this, it's really really hard to get IP addresses allocated to you unless you are a big service provider and you already have them. And so you can't really get into this get into the space and. Sadly, companies like IBM, Apple, and even Ford have millions of addresses they're sitting on that, that just they exist from back before ICANN was, uh, back when they, they were allocated more haphazardly. And, um, but I'm not going to complain about ICANN anymore. Um, whether they're benevolent dictators or harsh dictators really doesn't matter. The problem is that our protocols require that there be dictators. Um, 
And the routers, in order to, to figure out where to, to get packets, they have to talk to each other, and they talk using a, a protocol called BGP, or Border Gateway Protocol. Um, that's, it's old. It basically amounts to, hi, I'm responsible for all IP addresses that start with three, and then everybody re repeats that, and then when they have a packet that is going to an IP address starting with three, they will just send it in my direction. Um, it, security is done manually. If I don't really own the three block, then uh, they have to filter it. Somebody has to manually write this filter. Um, that's kind of a disaster, because basically what it amounts to is you can, uh, it, it's, very hard to get to operate these things. You can get into the, you can take a few years of college and you can learn how to, and you can become a, uh, a certified network architect, but uh, you really need a lifetime to, to really get BGP and, and be able to really keep the routers working. Um, it's possible to get on the internet to get a internet company without all this mess. The problem is that you basically locked into your provider because you say, I need your internet and give me some IP addresses with that. And then they're their IP addresses. And if you want to change providers, you have to change IP addresses. And you can only have one provider at a time because you know the IP addresses are, are associated with the provider. Um, and abuse complaints. Um, let's face it, we have a cultural clash over the fairness of downloading music and movies for personal use. People think it's okay, Hollywood thinks that it's not okay, and um, small ISPs get steamrolled by this clash, and they have to deal with the abuse, and if you are one of those ISPs that gets your IP addresses from your provider, then your provider sends you an email that says like, uh, our IP addresses have been associated with abuse, and we want you to fix this. You don't have any options, really. You basically have to turn your customer off. You don't have any legal recourse so, and, and if you're a big ISP, you do have legal options. You can go through a process. And so, yeah, small ISPs, they, they just get terrorized. Um, then, of course, we have no security. And we all know this, you know, you, your, uh, your packets, anybody can alter them, anybody can read them between source and destination. Um, and uh, um, because you, you, they can alter them, you have no real assurance of who you're talking to. And because you don't have assurance of who you're talking to, uh, cryptography breaks down. Um, cryptography doesn't work if you start an encrypted connection with the bad guy. Okay. Um, so we have all these, all these, uh, um, these methods of trying to solve it uh, by like X509. That's that's the HTTPS. That's if you do online banking. But that doesn't really work either because there's a whole bunch of um, of, of companies that uh, are, are responsible, they're, they're like notaries. But if any one of them breaks, it breaks everybody's security. Okay, so if anyone could sign something that's invalid, that's what DigiNoter, their problem was that caused um, Gmail accounts to be uh, to be uh, attacked by uh, Iranian citizens, uh, that who were people who were living in Iran, their Gmail accounts were attacked. So you break one, you break them all, that, that's horrible security. Um, and more, moreover, if we, you can't have a mesh network and it won't scale if, you're, if your neighbors can spy on your traffic because, you know, you might not like the government doing it and there are a lot of arguments that they shouldn't, but if your neighbors can do it and people can just drive up in a van and do it, then that's just not going to work. So we need something better. Um, so yeah, the internet has got some problems. You can't get an IP address. Um, anybody who really understands BGP already has a high-paying job at an ISP. Already, you know, why would they want to start a new one? Um, people believe it's okay to download movies. Hollywood disagrees. Small ISPs get steamrolled, and there's basically no security. Um, and that's that was okay in like the 80s because they were using top-of-the-line technology for the 80s. Now we have really, really fast, really powerful security that. You can encrypt something, and basically nobody can read it. Um, so, yeah, uh, in 1997, the IEEE authored 802.11, better known as Wi-Fi. Since then, it's been theoretically possible to build ad hoc community networks, which would, for the first time, bring meaningful competition to the telephone and cable monopoly, or duopoly. And that's more so more true in the United States than here. 
Um, although I understand that still you pay a lot, you don't get very much for your internet. Um, it's 15 years later and it hasn't really happened. We don't have much for these networks. They exist, but they don't scale and they don't become commercial. Um, why? Well, when you start to ask why, you see these problems come up again. It's really hard to set up routers. It's really hard to get IP addresses. Uh, decentralized networks, they have major security issues. And, you know, unwarranted wiretapping by bad neighbors. That, that's bad. Um, and then, we don't have any real way for network operators to get paid. At large ISPs, they can sit down over coffee and come up with these uh, agreements about, you know, if this much traffic flows from my uh, internet service to yours, then you pay me the, this amount, and then if you send more traffic th through my network, then uh, you'll pay me whichever whichever way the, the traffic flows. But this doesn't really scale. We, we, can't, we can't expect regular people to do this building commercial multi-party mesh networks in communities. Um, now, let's just imagine Every packet's encrypted and authenticated from source to destination. Imagine that your IP address is just derived from your cryptographic public key, so you can have them anytime you want. No more allocation politics. How about if routers were just did the right thing without network engineers having to write all the rules manually? And suppose compensation was built right into the protocol. Compensation for if you run a fiber from here to there, you'll get paid for the traffic that flows over that fiber, and that's just right in the protocol. Now, what's CJDNS? What's it attempting to solve? What are the other uh, options in the field? How do they compare? CJDNS, my project, is a protocol implementation invention free software project and experiment. CJDNS aims to make multi-owner commercial mesh networks feasible by simplifying setup and improving security. CJDNS gives everyone an IPv6 address. It's derived from the first 16, but uh, uh, it's derived from their public cryptography key, so nobody can forge a packet, nobody can say, ah, oh, this came from somebody else. No, it doesn't work because the key is wrong. The, the crypto doesn't work out. Now, because these are cryptographically derived IP addresses, you're probably asking, some people here, I'm sure, are asking, now, okay, how do you keep from scanning over all 2.5 billion addresses? Well. You remember the uh, analogy with the car stopping at every intersection to ask directions? CJDNS doesn't work that way. In CJDNS, there is a, you look up a route, and then you convert that route into a uh, binary encoded path, and then you send the packet through the network, and all routers along that path will just faithfully send it uh, right, left, right, right, whichever way the bits in the top of the packet say to send it. This is important because this means that routers, that I can have one neighbor that's con that I'm connected to, and I can, I can still be connected to nodes that he does not know about. I can still communicate with nodes directly through the switch layer that he does not know exist. This means that I can stay in touch with nodes whose IP address is similar to mine, and the neighbors can stay in, in touch with nodes whose IP address is similar to theirs, and when I get a packet, that I don't know the destination, I don't have a route to the destination of that packet, I will just send it to who, whomever has a similar address to the destination address of the packet, hoping that they have a route to it. Okay, what about payment handling? And this part is not written yet, so I'm kind of making this up. I can't prove that it works. Um, what I see working is a scheme where each packet is, is flagged as, with an amount of money which is, going, is worth, uh, the amount of money which can, when you send the packet, is worth pushing it through. And then we can, uh, the, then each node just reads the amounts on the packets and uh, debits them from the node that sent them and credits them to the node that they send it to. And then this can be integrated with the congestion control, that is, when too much traffic goes into a router, it has to throw some of it away. That's congestion control. And that can be integrated to make sure that better finance packets are more likely to get through. So an email will have a tendency to be better financed than, say, somebody downloading uh, updates to Windows, whatever. So 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this also has the benefit of uh, um, preventing uh, or making denial of service attacks where you just send as much crap at, at one IP address as you can in order to flood their line out. Um, it makes them expensive because as that line becomes more and more flooded, that crap sending becomes more and more expensive. Um, it, and it makes sure that network bottlenecks are well financed because if there's one, one wire and all the traffic goes through that wire and that wire is at, at its limit, then that's where all the finance will pile up because that's where the packets have to be dropped. Um, the problem is preventing adverse incentives and that's why I haven't written it all yet. Now the ISP of the future. This is not necessarily CJDNS. CJDNS just defines the problem and defines the idea. We're going to have a decentralized community of independent entities competing to best fulfill one of three cooperating roles. They are either billing handlers, which manage accounts and distribute payments, or they're internet providers, which provide access to the outside internet, that is the IP4 addresses and the IP6 ICANN addresses, and, or they're an infrastructure provider, which just connects the customer to the, the uh, internet provider, or to another customer. Now, I'm going to show you what happens. See, these, uh, these billing handlers, the, they, uh, the customer will make an account with the billing handler, and the infra provider will make an account with, an, with any one billing handler. And so it's similar to a swift wire transfer. When you send data this way, they make sure that each infrastructure provider along that path is financed for moving your data. Now, you see the data moves this way, and the financing for that moves that way, and the, billing, the customer will send a signal to his billing handler saying, please um, tell this guy that I'm good for it. And the billing handler will make sure that, the customer, that they tell that uh, this infrastructure provider is told that, um, that the customer is uh, able to pay by whatever means that takes. Um, and then they will go through, through the path and, and get the customer to his internet. Obviously, if it's one customer to another, then uh, it's much more, it's much smaller uh, system. You don't have to go out into the internet. And that is about it. Now, I can take questions and I can um, expand on the CJDNS protocol itself. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes? Thank you very much. We were reserving questions for after the next speaker, so... Okay, I, will, uh, I can expand on the protocol and I can do demo. Okay, cool. We have like demo. five minutes. Demo. Yeah, demo. All right. <laughs> so, first I have to get on the internet because I'm somehow managed to fall off the internet. Demos are, are magic because they can make problems just come out of nowhere. <laughs> um, well, that looks good-ish. So, Uh, CJDNS is actually really easy to set up. It's just that everything else on my computer is really hard to set up. <laughs> and that's not working. This was one of those cases of like the shoemaker's shoes. You know, they, they have holes in them. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I'm on the internet. I really think I'm on the internet. Okay. And I will just... off an enormous amount of information. But right there you can see, um, no, that's discovering, I'm adding peers to my, uh, my 
uh, I have three direct connections, and of those three direct connections, I'll be able to find, um, and there it's telling me my IPv6 address, which I, which it's set, and then that's it's it's rolled it's folded over, but uh, that's the address of me, and that's derived from my cryptographic key. And then here we're discovering lots of nodes in the network, and now we have direct paths to them. And you can see over here is the uh, actual binary route that that path will take. It's a, it's a 64-bit integer. And uh, um, this stuff is really pretty. It's debug logging, and so you get lots and lots of it. But uh, what is probably a little bit more pretty is when you can actually pull up a website. And yeah, we don't have any uh, DNS at this point, but we have web. It's just that it's based on IP addresses. And here's a list of our nodes. We have 209 up right now and 797 that existed at any time. And, and you can see it's not like Tor slow. We can do better, <laughs> but we could definitely do worse. And these are, these are just nodes that were discovered by this guy, Mikey's engine, and he just dumped his routing table and then listed all the nodes that, he, that his node had discovered, and he, so these are what he has routes to. That's not necessarily a list of all nodes in the network. Now, let me see if I can get, get a map. Here is a one map of the network. And because we have the um, because we have the, uh, the the ability to um, because of the way that the the uh, nodes are uh, the uh, the paths are actually they're, they're literal routes we can splice them together and we can calculate whether one is behind another one and by that we can figure out basically who's connected to who else um, although we don't know their real names. We just know this node X is connected to node Y. And that's all there is. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Caleb. And next up is Mike Hearn. Five minutes, I'd say. 